The term disaster is thrown around a lot these days, and this is very much one of those days. GTA, the trilogy, the definitive edition was something that not even two months ago, people were probably feeling pretty good about. Remasters are still very much desirable to most fan bases as they are a way to experience the classics with modern conveniences. If you price them right, make some smart changes, and ensure they're polished to a mirror sheen, they can be quite profitable and go a long way into convincing your customers that you care. So today's episode is going to be a textbook example on how to fail at all of those things. So throw on your leather jacket or polyester suit and get on your vehicle of choice. It's time to find out what happened to Grand Theft Auto The Trilogy, the definitive edition. Aw oh, shit, here we go again. Okay, so, oh my god, there's just so much here. <laughs> All right, so this, Christ. Throughout 2021, people started to notice that Rockstar Games, a subsidiary of the Take-Two Corporation, began to harass modders who had spent years improving and enhancing Grand Theft Auto 3, Vice City, and San Andreas. There were multiple cease and desists, as well as an actual honest-to-god lawsuit, which was launched by Rockstar against said modders. This was the first indication that they were cooking up something, and the barbecue was happening on Grove Street. Ah, uh, yeah, Grove Street. They started as War Drum Studios and cut their teeth on such high-profile projects as porting the Wii version of Ghostbusters to the PS2, as well as lending their online expertise to the multiplayer of Lucha Libre, Heroes del Ring, cut to the Konami E3 presser now. We're going. Let's leave. Now. Fantastic! Jokes aside, everyone has to start somewhere, but even with very little experience, all of a sudden Rockstar started contracting them to port the 3D trilogy to mobile phones with, uh, very inconsistent results. These were the 10th anniversary editions and featured a number of random, arbitrary changes, along with one major one was that they all now played terribly. Not really War Drum's fault here, because this was old console code retrofitted to work on a device from the far-flung future that the original developers at Rockstar North could never have imagined in their wildest dreams. This then led to the awkward console remasters, sort of, this bit's confusing. While well, GTA 3, Vice City, and San Andreas got backwards compatible emulated versions on consoles, the latter, for some reason, was replaced by Wardrum's mobile port, which had graphical changes like increased draw distance, no fog, different lighting, and of course, more bugs. As to why this mobile port replaced the original, well, Rockstar helpfully explained by saying nothing. They actually never addressed it. Buster! Straight Buster! Plenty of fans bemoaned this move, feeling that all these visual enhancements altered the look and feel of San Andreas for the worst. In addition to that, though, this port also suffered from an inconsistent frame rate, with very regular dips and hitching, which made for a version that most hardcore fans would consider quite terrible. If you're a casual fan, however, you probably didn't hear about any of this when it was going down in 2014, and that's because it was never really advertised advertised as some big new definitive edition. So let's see what happens when it actually is. Five years later, Rockstar decided they would do much of the same, re-release the GTA 3D trilogy, but this time make a big deal out of it, label them the definitive you'll never need to own any other version again editions, and for some reason hire Wardrum, who had rebranded themselves to Grove Street, to port them again. This is the one aspect of the whole sordid affair I can't really figure out or even hazard a guess as to why. Does one of the Hauser brothers owe a giant favor to Grove Street? Do they just not charge a lot for porting work? Like, out of all the studios Take-Two owns, who said, oh, hell yeah, these are the guys? I'd understand if their previous work was, well, you know, well-received, but let's face facts, it wasn't. Now, to bring all three of these open-world classics to every modern platform, well, it was never going to be an easy task. So Grove Street, for reasons we'll get into, decided they needed to take a uh, particular approach. In an interview with The Gamer, Rockstar producer Rich Rosado broke down this approach. 
The thing that drew people to these titles early on was the very specific way that they felt. So when it comes to redoing them, you hit a crossroads. You can either try and rebuild them and improve them, and in doing so, that means rescripting everything and adding new physics. Or you acknowledge that these games had a very secret sauce that people fell in love with, and would be a fool's errand to try and replicate every single element, the good bits and the frustrating bits. This brought a lot of technical headaches, but it gave us what we wanted. We then took advantage of the effects available in the new renderer, which enabled us to do far more than just add a new lighting effect here or there. You have a whole toolbox to play with. We also had plugins for current generation consoles, which made our lives a lot easier when it came to supporting those platforms. Let's break that all down, shall we? Rockstar North made the original trilogy on the 6th gen workhorse renderware, which sadly is no longer in use. So they decided to rip out the base code and plop it into a new renderer, which in this case was Unreal 4, a very different beast. They would then use Unreal 4 to fiddle with just about everything. The lighting, character models, textures, weather effects, physics, all that stuff. And as he said, using Unreal 4, which does support all consoles, would help maximize potential profits, which Rockstar is very fond of doing. Where's the goddamn money? Now, reportedly, things didn't start out this way. They were going to be very basic ports at first, with the only new change being a lighting system upgrade. I mean, we gotta upgrade Tommy's model. I mean, uh, look at it. And, and then we gotta do the same for Rosenberg. Shit, you know, we could tinker with the shooting mechanics too. Now, on a base level, that doesn't sound like the worst idea in the world. You do want to preserve what people remember, but if you don't change or update enough stuff, then you ain't convincing Joe Blow Splamoni to fork out 60 clams. The problem comes with taking such old 3D code and hoping it'll play nice with modern tech. There's uh, going to be lots of issues and incompatibility, and that's doubly so when you're working on vast open world environments. So if you're going to do this, you're going to need a lot of time to polish and bug squash. And that goes triply so when you're releasing this on like half a dozen machines. You can pretty much already see where I'm going with this. More and more problems started to crop up as they were navigating all the technical hurdles as well as making a lot of hard artistic decisions. If you were remaking a game from scratch, like say in the style of the Resident Evil or Demon Souls remakes, you can design and build as you see fit, with everything adhering to a consistent overall vision. But in Grove Street's case, they constantly needed to hem and haw on what to update and what to leave alone across three giant cities, which is something Rosado also also tried to explain. The problem is that back then you would make a game, print it on media, ship it, and that was it. We never thought we'd have to revisit these projects. When we were looking for the audio, it was compressed, as it should be, but then you'd try to find the source audio and we often couldn't. Same with source textures and the reference material that was used to build the original character models. At first we'd say, let's just do the hero buildings, CJ's house, Tommy's hideout, and so on, but then there would be a mismatch something would look really nice, then you'd walk two blocks over and the quality wouldn't match up. That's when we started putting a paintbrush over everything in some shape, way, or form. Grove Street then opted to use machine learning algorithms as their paintbrush and went over almost everything. Textures, character models, fonts, just, you know, the entire game world. Now, if you were just doing these touch-ups to say GTA 3, you probably wouldn't have needed to lean on Skynet to do the upscaling for you, but for reasons we'll discuss later, Grove Street was tasked with sprucing up all three games at once, and don't forget, they are not a big company. If you were in their position with Take-Two snorting fire and smoke down your neck, you'd have probably done the same thing, but of course, this method was not foolproof. Well, <laughs> like at all. GTA 3 kept the slightly exaggerated, almost cartoon-like proportions of the 2D games, something that Vice City carried over a bit as well. San Andreas's style, though, leaned into something a bit more realistic and grounded when it hit stores in 2004. So while the paint over looks okay, not great, in the earlier games, applying the same upscaling algorithm to San Andreas resulted in things like this. My God, you're greasy. Rosado once again basically warned us that things were gonna look a little inconsistent. 
It's tough. You're worried about what people will think. You can clean up a car and add more geometry, and it'll look like it did before, just more current. But the characters were much more difficult, and involved a lot of iteration to make sure we were all comfortable with them. Now, I'm not sure of the level of comfort the team had with uh, Tommy, Ryder, or Denise here, but it couldn't have been all that much. These types of decisions and time-saving measures permeated the entire development, and applying Unreal 4 effects to render where code does things like this. Using machine learning to upscale thousands of bits of text produces bear box, and futzing with the mesh that makes up the world can give you glorious invisible bridges. Making the game in this way, understaffed and under extreme time pressure, was a recipe for what has been the biggest gaming laughing stock of 2021, and Rockstar tried to get ahead of it nice and early. GTA The Trilogy The Definitive Edition was officially announced in early October of this year, with its release date being a little over one month later on November 11th. It promised upgraded graphics and models, GTA 5 style aiming controls, a checkpoint system, 60 frames per second, <laughs> all the bells and whistles. By calling it definitive, Rockstar wanted to hammer it home. There's literally no reason to own any other version. Grab your old discs and burn them, and uh, burn your hard drives that stored them digitally too. You know what? We'll do that last one for you. Rockstar made sure to scrub every digitally available version of the 3D trilogy off of Steam and consoles, ensuring that players were only going to have one option. Now, don't get me wrong, that's scummy, but not unexpected. What was a bit odd, though, was Rockstar's reluctance to actually show off these definitive versions. No extended gameplay trailers showing off the new features and graphics, no information regarding the minutia like the soundtrack, technical specs per system, etc. There was a vague bullet list, some select screenshots, a shiny new logo, and that's literally it. The only gameplay footage they ever put out was during the week of release, with a trailer that showed less than a minute of gameplay. The other thing that players were concerned over was the staggered physical release, but for reasons never explained by Rockstar, the physical was delayed until December 7th. Now there could be a variety of reasons for this, uh, shipping delays or I don't know, a factory blew up, but for a company of their financial standing, it's not typical for the printing of discs to take a month longer unless it was by design. It's a bit easier to maximize profits out the gate by only selling a digital version that players can't easily refund, because it never looks good to walk into a store and see dozens of copies of a used game when that game just released. I know this is veering towards the speculative side, but you can easily imagine Rockstar easily imagining that this was going to see a lot of returns to GameStop. This theory is given even more weight now that as of the time of this writing, they've delayed the physical again by another 10 days and into next year for the Switch with no reason given. But the reason is to give Grove Street more time to patch. Ultimately, I don't think there's many of you out there that are chomping at the bit to get this physically, but I'm just bringing it up because there's a pretty good chance that this was a deliberate and calculated choice. This is a disaster. We are so screwed, man. Our penultimate warning sign that this project was destined to be featured on what happened was the complete lack of a day one patch. Now, this one is a bit of a stretch, so bear with me. Even the biggest, most hyped games get a day one patch. It's just the nature of modern game development. But curiously, the Definitive Edition did not have one, despite the fact that it really, really, really needed it. From what I understand, the patch that did come out a week after launch was supposed to be the day one patch, but for reasons not entirely clear, was delayed. It could be that Grove Street just needed some more time to get it done, since they had to make a patch that could apply to like six or seven different platforms. The only other thing I can think of is that Rockstar thought a day one patch might reflect badly on the product. Some fans might see that and go, oh, it's pro probably all busted up to shit. I'll just wait six months to a year until it's on sale. The Rockstar didn't really want to wait that long for it to generate revenue. They wanted it. No, 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 no! 
Uh, but no, most likely Grove Street couldn't handle the workload, which wouldn't surprise me because they only have 21 total employees. That's insane. Not sure how accurate that number is, but it's the most common one floating around on the internet. Uh, this might explain why those algorithms were used. The last cherry on this sloppy Sunday was the fact that there were zero advanced review copies. Now, this wasn't an NDA, by the way, because that actually looks worse. It's just that they didn't send early codes to any websites. If a review were to come out, it would most likely be days after launch. Again, a tactic used to mask the collection's quality. All of these precautions were to cover up the fact that these definitive editions were going to be missing a litany of features, and players were going to need to buy it to find out for themselves. The overhead classic camera perspective from GTA 3? Gone. The cinematic NPC and helicopter cameras from the sequels? Also gone. The co-op mode from San Andreas? You guessed it! 29 different songs from Rage Against the Machine to Ozzy Osbourne and NWA? Try to act surprised. I will give them a bit of slack here because sometimes record labels just don't want to relicense the song or make it so expensive that it winds up not really being worth it. Then there's all the stuff you just couldn't do, either because of bugs or they just plain forgot. You now needed to always stop moving before jacking a car and were no longer able to just press Y while running to jump in. Dozens of environmental props like bushes and fences were remeshed and made solid so you could no longer drive through them to take familiar shortcuts. Fog, which was an artistic choice that also masked a technical limitation in San Andreas, was removed, leading to the city to feel more empty and less realistic, especially since LA, you, you know, has, has a lot of poison in its air. People were initially very excited about the much-touted GTA V style shooting mechanics, and to be fair, many of the earlier 3D aiming systems in these games weren't the smoothest in the world. However, this change, which was set in the options to be on by default, felt just as awkward and clumsy. Maybe if they had more time to reiterate on it, it could have been ironed out, but as it is, it just feels off and unnatural, almost as if the original games lacked the specific animations and subtleties to make such an overhaul work. It's just something that the original code was never designed for. All of these issues and more, I mean a lot more, were laid bare for all the world to see on November 11th, as all of Rockstar's precautions and damage control couldn't control all the damage, especially when it came to their own game launcher. On the same day the Definitive Edition came out, the Rockstar launcher was experiencing uh, issues, so it went down for two whole days. This meant anybody who had purchased a Rockstar game through it wasn't able to play it. When it went back online, players were still a little myth that the Definitive Edition still wasn't accessible and had to wait an additional day for it to come back. Rockstar's explanation? Unintended game files were apparently still present on the version that was initially uploaded, and they were taking steps to remove them, and that's all they really said about it. Modders and hackers, however, were able to put together what these unintended game files were, which ranged from all the removed songs that were still in the code they had just been disabled, to developer notes, which also could have been pretty incriminating, and finally, the infamous and always hilarious Hot Coffee minigame. Always hilarious because this random collection of polygons rubbing and clipping through each other cost Rockstar $20 million in a lawsuit back in the 2000s. Remember Remember the decrepit gargoyle that was Jack Thompson? Of course you don't. Now normally, the PC version, because of its nature, would perform the best on a technical level and be the quickest to patch, but because it was down for three days, guess who had to get the message out there that the definitive editions were rougher than a badger's ass? These guys, that's who. Cue the bug montage!
So, yeah, there, there's not much to say, is there? Now, we should all be used to the fact that open world games have their issues. It's a tale as old as time, or more accurately, like, like 20 years old, but these definitive editions were way worse than the original releases and were buggier than any other Rockstar game ever? So, it's because of all of that that GTA, TTT, DF quickly saw the lowest user score in video game history, oh, up until this point, and Rockstar and Grove Street's social media channels essentially shut down for almost a week, giving no updates to the masses who were pleading for some kind of sanity. Thousands of players started demanding refunds, and if this had released on Steam, that would have gone pretty smoothly. But because the Rockstar launcher was the only game in town, some poor some bitch had to control plus V. If you'd like a refund, please submit a support ticket at rockstarsupport.com until their eyes bled. Oh, and by the way, many players have still stated that their tickets were never answered. Things kept getting worse. The massive nerds over at Digital Foundry did a damning series of videos that revealed the Xbox Series X and PS5 struggled to run these games at consistent frame rates. These almost 20 year old games. In fact, out of all of the consoles, it was the PS4 version running on a PS5 that produced the most solid frames per second, but of course you had to sacrifice pixel count to get it. With this in mind, I've enlisted the expertise of John Linneman from DF to give us a further exhaustive breakdown as to just how these console versions performed at launch. John? They're all bad. Thank you. After a full week, Rockstar finally pulled their head out of the sand in what I'm sure was intended to be a somber, remorseful blog post. Hi everyone, we want to provide an update regarding the unexpected technical issues that- Let me stop you right there! Unexpected technical issues! This really twists my balls into a knot, as it's a subtle hint that Rockstar somehow was caught unawares by this reception. Oh, the QA department didn't tell us about these problems, we had no idea! Having spent seven years in QA, let me assure you that was not the case. They bugged the hell out of these games, but unless it was a crack a progression blocker, or some type of legal issue, like a song, those bugs fell on deaf ears and even more closed eyes. And that's not because Grove Street didn't care, it's because they didn't have time to care. Now, as for the unintended game files, yes, that was certainly an oversight, but had nothing to do with the QA department. It's something Grove Street and Rockstar should have double checked, but when you're rushing a product out the door, it's something that can go unnoticed. I'll give them that. The post slash apology did go on to announce two things of note. A pittance was given to PC players who had purchased the definitive editions with free versions of the three original games, you know, the ones they had previously delisted, as a I'm Thawi, will you forgive me? And console players, of course, got nothing. No original versions were uploaded to the digital stores of the Xbox or PlayStation, and even the PC freebies were only relisted on Rockstar's launcher and nowhere else. You'd think they might have also wanted to relist the Steam versions they had taken down as a sign of good faith and maybe for a small fee, but I, I guess they didn't want to give Gabe his percentage. The last nugget of info from Rockstar's blog post was that a patch was arriving in the coming days, but oddly the coming days meant less than 20 24 hours later. Version 1.02 went live for everything but the Switch, and the change list had over 50 supposed fixes, and when I say supposed, it's because many issues, like the janky rain and invisible bridges, saw almost no difference. Check out this great Twitter thread from my friend Shane where he goes through the change list and checks off everything that wasn't actually fixed, even though the list said otherwise. It's pretty clear this first patch was not ready and was also rushed out as a form of damage control. QA was not given enough time to vet and double check these fixes, which made fans even more angry, which was the opposite effect of what this patch was supposed to do. Jeez, when it rains, it absolutely pours. 
Unfortunately though, as of the time of this writing, a second patch has finally rolled out with over 100 more issues addressed, and not only just bug fixes, but actual tangible improvements. Things like the spelling errors, the fog, or ground haze being added back into San Andreas, although it's still not optimal. The cinematic camera returns, although the HUD still appears. The rain now reacts normally against bodies of water, as well as the correct menu sounds for GTA 3 and Vice City. Hell, even a good amount of NPCs have seen some improvement. A lot of fans fear that since the mobile versions and the PS4 remaster of San Andreas saw almost no post-launch support, the Rockstar might have just said, ah, fuck it. So it is good that things are being addressed. It's just, man, all of this could have been avoided. But why wasn't it avoided? Well, lots of people are pointing to a particular event in Rockstar's release schedule that I think is a pretty viable explanation into one of the reasons why this was such a massive cluster. Like most businesses, Rockstar slash Take-Two wanted to cash in on the lucrative holiday shopping season, and like most businesses, their fiscal year always concludes at the end of March. So it really behooves one to release products several months ahead of that fiscal cutoff so it'll have a longer tail to generate revenue, and Rockstar originally planned to have a pretty big product in that position. Let me remind you of the next-gen versions of GTA V, Rockstar's eternal moneymaker, which has sold over 150 million copies since 2013. These enhanced and expanded ports, they still haven't fully explained what that means, were originally scheduled for a November 2021 release, when they were publicly announced last May. But uh, what was the precise launch day? Well, that would be November 11th. Cut to a few months later, just this past September, where Rockstar uploaded a new trailer which revealed a delay to March 22nd, 2022. Ah, right before that magic cutoff date. They never explained the reasons for this delay, they just kind of pretended that the November 11th release was never actually a thing, I, I don't know. Regardless, with this license to print money getting pushed out of the holiday season, who would fill in that gap? GTA Definitive, I'm looking in your direction! Apparently, progress on the trilogy was going at a snail's pace, as the original plan was for it to be announced and released in the first three months of the year, but it wasn't ready due to the aforementioned technical problems between RenderWare and Unreal, COVID-related delays as the entire QA department at Rockstar had to test from their homes, etc. It was then moved to the summer. Still not ready. Oh shit, well now GTA 5 has slipped. It, it won't be ready. Well, it fucking better be. Rockstar needed something out that holiday season, and if the Definitive Edition wasn't quite up to snuff yet, well, that wasn't exactly their problem. What they could do was try to maximize the trilogy's chances to generate profit, so they scrubbed every alternative version of the games off the Digiverse, i.e. the mods and original releases. This also explains why the Definitive Edition was announced a mere month before its release date. There wasn't going to be any more extensions or delays, as this this was a very last minute decision. Now, I know hindsight is 2020, and I'm no rock star marketing scientist, but wouldn't the better option have been to have Grove Street remaster just GTA 3 for this year, since it is that game's 20th anniversary, and then do the same for Vice City the following year, and so on? This would have drastically cut down all the work that needed to be done all at once, therefore allocating more time for polish and QA. And when San Andreas releases, then you sell them together in a triple pack. You know, the opposite of what you did. Hell, that's similar to how they released the 10th anniversary mobile versions a decade prior, but when GTA 5 was delayed, the schedule was locked into place and bugs were ignored. The far-fetched idea that a company would be more concerned with potential profits rather than releasing a broken product is- What am I talking about? That's not far-fetched at all. A lot of people liken this situation to being just as bad as Cyberpunk 2077's launch, and I think that's ridiculous, because it's actually worse in a lot of respects. 
Cyberpunk was a massive open-world action RPG FPS that had to be built from the ground up, featuring far more complex world design and visual detail. Not only was it a huge undertaking for CD Projekt Red to launch what was essentially a new video game IP, but it was a big switch in genres, deviating greatly from what they had done before. But GTA the Trilogy? These were just remasters of 20-year-old PS2 games. Yes, of course, they had their own unique technical hurdles, but this should have been the easiest slam dunk in the world for Rockstar and Grove Street, but instead they fell flat on their face during the run-up to the hoop. All they really needed was a bit more time, and not even a lot. Had they been given, like, an extra three months to address all the smaller visual issues and effects, I might not even be talking to you about it right now. If they continue to patch it, eventually it'll be much closer to what most people were expecting, but the damage has already been done, as this is going to stand proudly shoulder to shoulder with Silent Hill and Warcraft 3 as one of the worst remasters of all time, and won't be forgotten as a cautionary tale anytime soon. It's also quite apt that this whole debacle dredged up cyberpunk because it perfectly segues into my clever ending of this video, a poorly aged quote from Take-Two CEO Straws Zelnick. Oh, he has to be a real life James Bond villain. When asked about CD Projekt's infamously troubled launch. That was a rival studio's work that didn't live up to the hype. I think the case that you're alluding to reflects the fact that you're always better served to wait for perfection if you can create perfection. And all of our labels are seeking perfection. And we don't always succeed. Sometimes we fall short, but that's the goal. What we do know is that we will wait for it to be as close to perfect as anything can be. Ah, uh, absolute poetry, Mr. Zelnick. If you know of any other catastrophic capers that were fiscal failures, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or drive into the Flophouse VIP Spray and Pay and become a big boss and nominate what I'll be covering in a future episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching. This game will lead to real-world violence in schools and real-world increased aggression and violence in adolescents and teenagers. I will hunt you down and find you, and I will kill you. One, two, three, wicked!